Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome and Merry Christmas. Here, December 3rd, 2023, first Sunday of Advent. Welcome. Glad you're all here. Glad you're joining us for the first Sunday of Advent. As well as those of you joining us online, we welcome you as well. So it wouldn't be Advent without Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day and that you have made and for this new opportunity to gather in your name to lift praise and to lift worship to you. We thank you and we praise you for blessing us and watching over us through the week and for gathering us together here again into your house. As we enter into this new Advent season and as we partake of the Lord's Supper today, we want to just thank you for your willingness to come to this earth, to not simply be born, but to grow up and to eventually take our place on that cross that was meant for us, that we deserved. Thank you, O oh Lord Jesus, for being willing to be our Savior. Through this Advent season, help us to see and remember and appreciate exactly why it was that you were born into this world. We commit this service to you now. We pray that your work and your will would be done in it. Help us, O oh Lord, to hear your voice and to leave this place ready to do the work that you have for us this week. We ask this all in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one that's coming again. Amen. Uh, for announcements this week, there are several. There are many. Um, throughout your bulletin there, take your bulletin home, pin it up. Uh, lots of things going on. Um, beginning uh, with a, we've got a board meeting on a Tuesday evening. All, all official board members, please join us for that. Uh, ladies, ladies Bible study um, happening on Saturday. Uh, a lot of Christmas parties coming up. Uh, men, we need your final decision if you're going to join us next week. Uh, we could also use your money also, so we want to make a check from the church, so um, if we get that from you next week, that would be great as well. Uh, movie night's coming up, uh, other parties, all kinds of stuff, so please uh, make note of that, and again, take this home and uh, join us for whatever you're able to. Uh, a couple other important things, it is Communion Sunday, uh, so benevolent offering envelopes are in the pew racks, that helps us to help people in our congregation that may need uh, some assistance. It's Christmas time, poinsettia time, uh, so please uh, make use of the order form if you want to give a poinsettia in honor or memory of somebody that's there for you as well. <coughs> Skip has an announcement, so Skip. <coughs> After the worship service today, anyone out there who has a history that dates back to Barber Street, whether it's you personally that had gone there or, or, or your, fam your family, there are, there are people out there who have family uh, history that dates back to there. But uh, I'm, I'm looking at Anna, for example. She wasn't even born back then, but her family history goes back back to that. Anyone who has a history that dates back to the Barbara Street location, I would ask them to stay after the worship service for, for a, a moment. I've got something I want to go over with you. Um, if I need to, I'll remind you after the service to, uh, to stay. I that's all the announcements, unless somebody else has something they need to share. If not, let's join together in a carol. Number 173, Joy to the World.
this is the first Sunday of Advent, and I uh, shall light one of the purple candles. Uh, the first uh, candle is uh, symbolizing hope. That's what it symbolizes. So as I light the candle, <coughs> And just a short prayer if you would join me. God of hope, we light this candle as we prepare for the coming of your Son. Awaken our hearts so that when Christ arrives, we are ready to receive him with all our hearts, all our mind, and all our strength. In the redeeming hope we have in Jesus, and in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. A reading from... God's Word, Genesis 1, chapters, uh, chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, and verse 31. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all, all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and it subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And John chapter 1 verses 1 through 5 in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. As we begin the Advent season, we look forward to Christmas to celebrate the birth of Christ. The whole world sometimes seems to focus only on the baby, other things too, shopping and, and, and whatnot. Uh, but this is no ordinary baby. As difficult as it may be, be to understand, let us not forget this, is, this baby was present right from the beginning, right with God, long before his birth on earth. Nothing was created without him, nothing, any, anything, nothing in heaven above nothing on earth below, and certainly not us. Verse 26 of Genesis chapter once again says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Let us pray. Thank you, Sovereign Lord and Creator, for this day of beginnings and remembering. Thank you for making us in your glorious image, for honoring us with dignity and purpose. We praise you in this season of remembering who you truly are and how you have drawn near to us because of your great love for us. Give us wisdom as we prepare to celebrate the birth of your son that you sent to us. We will rejoice in this season of remembering, knowing that everything you have given and, and done is always not simply good, but very good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Skip. We actually do need a couple other readers from Advent, so if you're willing to do that, you can see me and, we'll, and I'll get you on the, on the list. First of all, did anyone, everyone get a communion thing on your way in? If you didn't, now would be the time. I personally think it's very appropriate to celebrate the Lord's Supper during the Advent season. Because this kind of tells the complete story of Jesus, minus the resurrection, of course. But did you know that Christmas, the birth of Jesus, was not really celebrated until around 336? And that was not celebrated as a major holiday until about the 9th century. 
Jesus did not talk much about his birth, if at all. I, I wonder why that is. Probably because even though his birth began his mission, what he would grow up to do was much more important. I thought about the certain births that we celebrate. You know, we celebrate George Washington's birthday. We celebrate Abraham Lincoln's birthday. And we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday. Why do we celebrate those birthdays? Because of what they grew up to do, right? One was the father of our country. One was one of the greatest presidents in our country's history. And, and one did great work in promoting civil rights. So as much as I love Christmas, and I hope you enjoy uh, being decorated for Christmas, <laughs> what Jesus grew up to do is much more important than what we're going to celebrate on the 25th. It's true that without Christmas, there would be no Easter. But without Easter, there wouldn't be any Christmas that we'd be celebrating. So we talk about Jesus during this time of year being the greatest gift ever given at Christmas. And that's so true. Because he grew up, he lived a perfect, sinless life, and then was sacrificed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And that, what he grew up to do on the cross, is why we celebrate Christmas. So I think it's very appropriate that we share the Lord's Supper this morning. Jesus had gathered with his disciples in the upper room, knowing what was coming, preparing for what was coming. But while he was celebrating that, he paused during the meal and took a piece of bread and he offered prayer for that. I'm going to pray for this bread right now. Father God, we thank you so much for this little piece of bread that represents Jesus' body. Thank you for sending him. Thank you, Jesus, for what you endured for us. And I just pray right now that as we partake of this together, Lord, that you would really impress and remind our, us on our hearts on what it really means for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And then another point during the meal, Jesus took a cup. And again, he, he blessed it. And I'm going to offer prayer for this juice. Father, once again, we thank you for what these emblems represent. But we are so thankful for this blood, or what represents your blood. Because, Lord, we know that there's life-giving power in that blood. Thank you for letting your blood be spilled for the forgiveness of our sins. And how that fact alone has changed our lives, changed our, our future. Thank you so much for this juice that represents your blood. And I pray again, Lord, as we partake of this together right now, again, impress upon our hearts, remind us of what it means to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do it whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We're going to just go to prayer. Quickly, I wonder if there's anything specific we can be praying for. Yes, Jill? Father, my health, do I commit suicide? Then what? Do I commit suicide? Someone you know? He's in the hospital with critical illness. Okay. Anyone else? Joe? I'm grateful that my uh, procedure is this week, but normal, and uh, the therapist sees the swamp side to be good. Good. Thank God for that. Great. Anyone else? Cindy? Um, you know, my upcoming consultation for my elevated
Anyone else? Yes, Joanna? Send the mail when you can. Okay. All right. I'm sorry, I, I cannot, my mind is going blank. What What is he in here, uh, Jake? Which one is he in? Coast Guard. Coast Guard, I couldn't think of that name. Thank you. All right, let's go to prayer again. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, we thank you so much for the season that we're in, Lord, as we celebrate the birth of your son and what that means to us as Christians, Lord. What an incredible gift that you have given us, Father. And Lord, as we come in this place, we just pray, Lord, that everything we do and say will bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, you are so worthy of our worship. May we worship you today, God. Help us, each of us, to focus on you this morning. Help distractions to be out of the way. And again, help us to focus on what you're saying and what you want to teach us this morning. God, we do come to you with needs this morning, things on our hearts. And Lord, I want to pray for this person tried to commit suicide. Lord, you know the details, what's going on in that person's life. I pray that you would be with them in their hospital room, be with the doctors and nurses. God, would you please use them to, to minister to this person. Lord, first of all, we pray physically that they would recover, but Lord, I just pray, even more important than that, that Lord, that you would be working in their hearts right now. Help them, God. Father, I want to lift up Cindy as she goes to this doctor's appointment. I just pray that you would be with her and, this, and, and the doctor, Lord, just help um, just to be helpful. And, and Lord, that uh, these things that he's going to want her to do, Lord, that you would give her strength to do those things. Father, I do want to lift up Eric as he's in basic training for the Coast Guard. Lord, please just uh, be with him and help him along. And uh, just so thankful, Lord, that he's had this opportunity to just be with Eric. And Father, I want to lift up Johanna's son, Matt, in Japan, and just pray that you would give safety, and, and uh, Lord, just be with him there. Lord, you know there's other things on our minds, on our hearts today. And I just pray, God, that you, you the, the life-giving, the, the provider, would meet all our needs, God. We bring them to you today. And now, Father, we want to pray that prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. go to our scripture readings this morning, let me remind you to do your homework. Remember last week we got our little Advent devotional booklets, the Christmas Code. I hope you've been reading it. If you didn't uh, get one last week, there's some more out on the table, so please take one on your way out. Scripture reading for the morning is found in the book of Isaiah. We'll be reading Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 17. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. May God have a blessing for the reading of his word. Thank you. 
Medley, Jesus, name above all names, and Noel. So if you would.
Yeah, you can see it. Well, this morning we begin a Christmas series, if you will, called The Promise Fulfilled. But let's just bow for a word for it. Father, once again, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your presence in this place. And Lord, my prayer very simply is that you right now, your Holy Spirit is the one that's going to speak to our hearts. Lord, help us, help us to be listening with our ears and our hearts to what you want to say to us this morning. And I pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So how are you doing with your Christmas shopping? Is there anyone that's done, by the way? One of my friends on Facebook had a post that not only did they have their shopping done, but they even wrapped. I just, whatever. But you better get going because there's only three weeks left, so you better get out. How many here gathered, though, remember the Sears catalog growing up? We thought we had it made, didn't we? Because our parents would say, you know, here's the catalog, now I want you to mark what you want for Christmas. And I suppose that probably made it easy for our parents and our grandparents. But you know, the truth is that we've almost gone full circle and made it back to them. Now, instead of a catalog, right, you have the internet and Amazon. Kind of the same, right? But only a few clicks, and you could be done with your shopping. Well, without letting the cat out of the bag, a few days ago, something arrived at my house that I had bought for Kathy for Christmas. Along with that item, and a packing slip, was a little card that very simply said, as promised. And I never received a message like that from something I had ordered. And it really got me thinking. And what my thought was this. We have a, a manger scene here. It would be very appropriate that along with this manger scene, there was a sign that said, your Savior is born as promised. We're now in the Advent season, right? On our way to Christmas. And obviously this time of year, we, we, we look at stories about, that we find in Jesus' birth or about Jesus' birth from, from Matthew or Luke uh, to read the details about his birth. But the Christmas story as recorded in the Bible actually begins much earlier than that. Hundreds of years earlier than that. Throughout the Old Testament, God placed hints and, and road signs in the various uh, writings of, of different prophets and other Old Testament authors promising sinful man the birth of a savior. So in reality, the first promise of the coming Christ was given by God way back in the very first book of the Old Testament, Genesis, in chapter 3, and verse 15. And in the midst of God, giving his judgment against Adam and Eve and the evil serpent for their part in allowing sin to enter the world, God the Father makes this amazing and really gracious promise concerning the coming of his own begotten Son to earth to become our Savior. So speaking to the ser serpent that allowed Satan to tempt Eve to sin, God says this, and again, Genesis 3, verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, that doesn't sound like something we would associate with the story of the baby in the manger, does it? But in this very first Christmas prophecy, God promised Adam and Eve that a child would be born from a descendant of Eve who would destroy sin's power over mankind. And that promised Messiah, we know, is none other than Jesus Christ. And at the cross of Jesus, God would deal a death blow to Satan's head that would be far more deadly than the bruised heel Satan's hatred would be able to inflict on our Savior. And this hatred of Satan would inspire men to bring much suffering upon Jesus. But by raising Jesus from the dead, God the Father, would deal a, deal a fatal blow against Satan by gaining victory over the power of both death and sin. But you know, my guess is that 
Adam and Eve unlikely understood the significance of these words when God made this pronouncement. But as the Old Testament gave more prophecies, the message became clearer. The prophet Isaiah, writing nearly 600 years before the birth of, of Christ, was given kind of the ability to see across the centuries, to give an, an incredibly accurate picture of the birth of our Savior. Listen to the words of the prophecy that we found in our scripture. Isaiah said, verse 14, 14, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. So Isaiah tells his readers that the virgin birth of Jesus would be a certain sign that the Messiah had come. This prophecy that, that we see here in Isaiah 7, 14 is often grouped together with the actual pronouncement made by the angels when they announced the birth of Jesus in Luke 2, verses 10 to 12. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So with the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, God placed his own as promised sign over all the Old Testament prophecies that spoke of the birth of the coming Messiah. See, the birth of Jesus as a tiny baby in Bethlehem from the womb of a virgin was an amazing supernatural sign. And this morning, I want to take us, or help us to take a look at three aspects of what this sign should mean for us today. So as a sign from God, the birth of Jesus as the baby in the manger is first of all this. An important sign of God's power. Old Testament and New Testament scriptures make it clear that the birth of Jesus was not a normal birth. It was a supernatural birth. Isaiah's prophecy clearly predicted that a virgin would conceive and bear a child. Now, without taking the time to go into biological details, virgins do not have babies. This was the only one. And I would think that this promise must have had some Jewish scholars wondering exactly what God meant by making such a promise. Some had no problem believing that, that God would cause a virgin to bear a son, but many probably wondered if the reference here to a virgin birth was maybe symbolic of something else. But then we read about the encounter that Mary had with the Lord's angel Gabriel announcing God's desire to bring his son into the world, then it can be no doubt what the prophecy meant. It meant exactly what it said. A virgin was going to give birth to Israel's promised Messiah. Now this birth of Jesus was prophesied by Isaiah and documented by Luke as, as a miraculous event unlike any the world has ever seen. And this virgin birth of Jesus was certain, was a certain sign of God's power. But sadly, we know that in our world, this is not an easy sign for someone to accept. The skepticism about the virgin birth of Jesus seems to be shared by many more people in our day. Because we live in a society that has elevated so-called science above scripture. So there are vast numbers of people today who scoff at the virgin birth of Jesus. Although I, I gotta tell you, I've noticed that they tend to only use science when it fits their agenda. Have you noticed that? But yet I would say that, that a majority of people today do believe in an all-powerful God. And if we believe in an all-powerful God, why should the virgin birth of Jesus cause anyone to scoff? Either God can perform miracles, or he can't. If God had the power to create heaven and earth and every form of life that dwells on earth in a single week, is it really that much of a stretch to believe that God could bring his son into the world through the womb of a virgin? Would the virgin birth of Jesus be more difficult of a miracle for God to perform than, than, than the parting of the Red Sea or 
providing manna to Israel in the wilderness for every morning for 40 years, or, or even feeding 5,000 with a small boy's lunch. Listen, no miracle is hard for an all-powerful God to perform. But there are some miracles that are a greater testament of God's power than others. For example, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God works through many different individuals to cause the lame to walk. But only by the hand of Jesus, God's only son, did anyone ever regain their sight. And that miracle, it seems, was reserved by God to be a certain sign of the Messiah. Well, the virgin birth is also in a class by itself. It's a miracle that is never repeated in Scripture. The virgin birth was reserved by God as a sign of his power to bring his son into the sinful world as a helpless baby, unique, uniquely qualified to become the sinless sacrifice that could pay the price of our sin. Because Almighty God, not Joseph or any other man, was his father. So in celebrating Christmas, we celebrate the fulfillment of this prophecy. God became man. Jesus, being God in the flesh, came and dwelt among us, being born of the Virgin Mary. Well, in Matthew and Luke's account of the birth of Jesus, it made clear that Isaiah 7, verse 14, had its ultimate fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. But the virgin birth of Jesus is, is, is more than just a sign of God's power. It's also a sign, an amazing sign of God's love. Isaiah's prophecy went on to proclaim that the one born of a virgin was to be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And with this prophetic name, God was making an amazing promise. God was promising that he himself would come to us in human form as the most certain sign of his love that he could possibly give. Now in the Old Testament, we do find Many accounts that speak of God appearing to individuals in human form, right? We are told that God walked in the garden with Adam. He appeared to Abraham as a weary traveler. Maybe he even appeared in, a, in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But with the birth of Jesus, God goes a step further to demonstrate his love for us. In the Old Testament, God took on human form, temporarily at least, but in the New Testament, when God wanted to communicate his love to us in the most convincing way possible, he sent Jesus into the world to be born of a virgin so he could walk among us as a living and breathing human being, able of experiencing all the frailties and limitations of, of our own human existence. And the theological word for this is incarnation, God becoming flesh and blood, and nothing proves the love of God more than his willingness to send Jesus to be born into this world from the womb of a virgin, to live in this world as a sinless man and then suffer and die the most humiliating death possible. Paul proclaims the, the depths of God's love for mankind in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. He says this, talking about Jesus, who, being in very nature God, do not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. There's a Christian author by the name of James Montgomery Boyce. And he eloquently documents the amazing things that Jesus' virgin birth, sinless life, and sacrificial death accomplished for mankind as an amazing sign of God's love. I want to share them with you. Jesus endured a human birth to give us a new spiritual birth. He occupied a stable that we might occupy a mansion. He had an earthly mother so that we might have a heavenly father. He became subject so that we might become free. He left his glory to give us glory. He was poor that we might be rich. He was welcomed by shepherds at his birth 
So we, through our new birth, can one day be welcomed by angels. He was hunted by Herod that we might be delivered from the grasp of Satan. And this is the greatest paradox of the Christmas story. It is that which makes it irresistibly attractive. It's the reversal of roles as God's cost for our benefit. God's cost for our benefit. So, but along with being an important sign of God's power and an amazing sign of God's love, the virgin birth of Jesus as a baby in the, man, baby in the manger of Bethlehem also is a certain sign of God's faithfulness. Now, a bunch of years ago, when our kids were small, there was an amazing coincidence that happened. Bill and Lois and Mika and my family met up at Great Wolf Lodge in Massachusetts. For those who don't know, Great Wolf Lodge is a place that has a water park and a hotel. But neither one of us knew we were going to be there. So needless to say, we were both surprised. Now, let's say I made the prophecy, or I make a prediction to you, that in January of 2024, I'm going to run into the Knights down at Twin Calm. I'm sure I'm, that not too many of you would be impressed, because that certainly could come true. Now, if we, when we had left Torrington all those years ago, on the way to Great Wolf Lodge, if I had made the prediction that we're going to meet the Knights there, that may have been impressive, right? But the prophecy we find in Isaiah 7, 14 was not a prediction that could be easily manipulated at all. Jesus' birth on Christmas Day in Bethlehem from the womb of a virgin was no coincidence. Here's the thing. Even if you reject what Isaiah 7, verse 14 says about Jesus being born of a virgin, to reject Jesus as the promised Messiah, you would still have to explain how, how all the other prophecies about Jesus' birth were fulfilled. See, see, Isaiah 7, 14 is far from the only Old Testament prophecy concerning the coming Messiah. In fact, there are over 300 separate prophecies concerning the coming Messiah in the Old Testament that Jesus' birth fulfilled. And most of these prophecies were made 600 years or more before the actual birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. See, God's certain faithfulness is definitely demonstrated by the amazing way that he orchestrated world events and individual circumstances so that, so that all the Old Testament prophecies were perfectly fulfilled by the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. Only a fool would believe the fulfillment of over 300 prophecies could be some kind of coincidence. And when we take the various prophecies and, and we put them together, they give us an amazing, detailed portrait of Jesus' birth, as well as a profoundly convincing sign of God's faithfulness. I want to take just a few minutes to point out just a few of the more significant Old Testament pro uh, prophetic predictions that were fulfilled through Jesus. In Genesis 18, verse 18, we read that Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. All nations on earth will be blessed through him is referring to the fact that the Messiah would descend from Abraham. And this prophecy would be given years before even his own son Isaac was born. And then Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, we read, He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time and forever. Isaiah the prophet kind of narrowed down Jesus' descendants by prophesying that Jesus was going to be an heir to the throne of David. In Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, it says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. This prophecy predicts the Messiah would be called out of Egypt because of God's love for him. And this is exactly what we read about in the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 3, uh, 2, verse 13 to 15. Here's what we read. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, when he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. And then there's one prophecy that we're all 
probably familiar with, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, ancient times. We all know about Bethlehem today, right? Because we sing about it every, every Christmas. But 2,000 years ago, Bethlehem was not a very well-known place, even to some of the Jews that lived in that region. It was a surprise that this great work of God would not have its beginning in a great city like Jerusalem, but instead in the little town of Bethlehem. Now, one of the two prophecies fulfilled by Jesus' birth might easily be written off by a skeptic as nothing more than a, than a coincidence. But can over 300 prophecies given by several individuals over 600 years be fulfilled by coincidence? That would be virtually impossible. How impossible, you may ask. Well, there was a mathematician. His name was Peter Stoner. And he used the science of probability to calculate the odds of just eight prophecies regarding the birth of Jesus being filled, fulfilled as a coincidence. Stoner says the mathematical probability that any man might fulfill eight unique prophecies of Christ by coincidence is one in 100 quadrillion. Or stated another way, one in 100 million billion. And then, to illustrate such a large number, Stoner suggests that we imagine covering the entire state of Texas with silver dollars. 100 quadrillion silver dollars would cover Texas two feet deep. Now, if we were to mark just one of those silver dollars, somehow stir them all up, and then blindfold a man and give him one chance to pick the marked silver doll from anywhere in the state that he wanted to go, his chances of success would be one in 100 quadrillion. Sounds pretty impossible to me. And that's only considering the chances of fulfilling eight prophecies by chance. What would be the odds if all 300 plus messianic prophecies were taken into consideration? One writer suggests that the only thing more remarkable than the fulfillment of messianic prophecy itself is the amazing number of people who willingly reject Scripture as the Word of God and Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah, even though the Bible's track record for, for prophetic fulfillment is 100%. So as we close, I want to make today's message a little more personal. Isaiah said, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Now, this sign was originally given by Isaiah to the wicked king Ahaz as a way of trying to convince him to follow God's direction at a critical time in the history of Israel. Well, have you considered the fact that this message may be a sign that the Lord is giving to you? If you've been looking for a sign of God's power, God's love or God's faithfulness. Today, the Lord has most definitely given a sign to you. The promised Messiah has been born. All the prophecies regarding Jesus' birth have been fulfilled. So with that in mind, do we dare doubt God's ability and intention to fulfill all the prophecies we have in his word regarding the second coming of Jesus? Do we dare doubt God's love or his understanding of our deepest needs? God will faithfully fulfill every promise he has ever made in Scripture to you and me in the same faithful way that he fulfilled all these messianic pro uh, promises concerning the birth of his son. We can truly trust the Lord to do what he says. Did you hear that? We can truly trust the Lord to do what he says. So I ask you, will you trust him today? Of course, the big question of that, if, if you're willing to trust him for your salvation. But also, listen, will you trust him today with your life, even when it's not going very well? Hopefully the answer is yes. Because here's one thing we know about God. He always keeps his promises. 
Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you so much on this first week in Advent. As we look back and see all your promises about Jesus fulfilled. All your promises about the Messiah fulfilled in Jesus. Thank you that you are a faithful God. Every promise you make, you are going to fulfill. Oh Lord, thank you. Help each one of us here, Lord, to trust you more. Yes, if there's someone here who's never trusted you for salvation, absolutely. Oh Lord, that's the first step. But Lord, help all of us to trust you. Especially when it's hard to trust you. Because earthly stuff get in the way. Distract us. Help us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit to put our full trust in you. Thank you, Lord. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We ask that you join us. The worst week comes up. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Let's stand together. Just a reminder for those who have an history that dates back to Barber Street, I'd like to have you join me uh, just briefly after the show. Jesus. Amen.